as he purchased our redemption with his own blood. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, and we are going to be finishing up our study of the fruit of the Spirit tonight. There's so much more that could be said, and, and I've, I've thought about, you know, you study the Bible, or maybe, maybe you preach through a passage, and, and you think that you have, you see everything that you can see, and then time passes, and you come back to that same passage, and you see more, and see different things, and see additional things that work with what you've already seen, and I'm sure that we could, we could spend a whole lot of time, we're not going to exhaust the riches of scripture. But tonight we're going to finish up our study of the fruit of the spirit and I pray that it's been a, a help to you. It's been a help to me and an encouragement. It's been a blessing to me to study again these traits that we think we know about and understand, but again as time goes on and you grow in the Lord, you understand more deeply the truths of God's word and he grows our faith and grows our our, our Christianity, our Christ-likeness in this way. Let's read Galatians 5, verses 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And we're not going to spend time on that last phrase but it is something worth meditating on. Against such, there is no law. These things are good. Good. They're always good. They're always helpful. They're always applicable. There is always a, a positive and profitable way that you can use these traits. There is never a time when they are inappropriate. And we're going to talk tonight about temperance. The last one in the list. It's the last one. But it's not least. All of the fruits of the Spirit are vital and essential. You can't take away one and still have the nature of God involved. God is, is all of these things and more. We could talk about the, the nature of God and how it's all-encompassing in so many different good things. But this is the fruit of the Spirit and these traits here listed in this passage. But you can't have one of these and, and truly have... Another, how can you have long-suffering without love? How, how can you be long-suffering and not have love? How can you have meekness without faith? Meekness is founded and rooted in faith. How could you have peace but no joy? How could you have gentleness without forgiveness? Or, I'm sorry, without goodness. How could you have gentleness without goodness? And, of course, we would say you, you, can't, you can't separate them. They're all connected. And, and yet, it's helpful for us to try to examine them in their turn. But when we're talking about God's nature and we're talking about God's traits, they're all entwined together. They're not categorized and separate and in their own cubby holes. And, and they don't uh, infringe and trespass upon each other. It's all really, they're just different facets of the same thing you think about a diamond and all of the cut edges and you can turn it and each one glitters and each one shines and sparkles and they're all beautiful and they're all different from each other but they're all connected they're all part of the same whole and the fruits of the spirit are this way and we would ask that same question about temperance how could you walk in the spirit and bear the fruits of his character but not have temperance. Temperance is essential. Temperance is inevitable. If you have the fruit of the Spirit in your life, if you are filled with the Spirit of God, temperance is inevitable. It's also a unique fruit from the others. Perhaps we could say, and, and I want to be careful here, because again, as I just said, these are not separate things that are very clearly set apart from all the others. They're really different facets of all the same nature of God. But maybe we could say, just to help describe it, we could describe the other fruits as, as being pure and consistent forces. And what I mean by that is 
love always do does loving things. Love brings love itself into a situation, and when love is at work, it does loving things. Faith trusts and does uh, trusting things, and, and we understand this, long-suffering and so on. And in this way, we could say that each of the other fruits that we've looked at bring their own unique element to one's life. If you love others, that, that trait in, infuses itself into your life and faith and so on. Temperance also brings its own unique element, but in a different way. We might say that temperance doesn't bring a separate element into the life. Instead, temperance regulates the other elements. Temperance modifies and controls and moderates. One word that defines temperance in the dictionary is the word moderation. And um, moderate, the word moderate means, it literally means limited, restrained, hence temperate. This is what the dictionary says. Observing reasonable bounds in indulgence. An example of this is as moderate in eating or drinking or in other gratifications. And we understand what, what this control or this moderation means, restraint. Temperance holds back. It restrains. But it's more than just simple restraint in the fruit of the Spirit here. As we'll see, the effect of temperance brings every part of our life into its proper place. In a similar yet flawed way to how God's nature is perfectly ordered and moderated. And this is the point. These, these fruits of the Spirit make us more like Christ. And that is the purpose of sanctification. That's what the Lord is constantly and, and, and continually doing in the life of the child of God, is to bring them more and more into the image of God himself. And temperance helps us in that. It brings our our nature and our, our thinking, our life, into a very similar picture of how God's nature is perfectly ordered and moderated. This is what the fruit of the Spirit does. It allows us to become more and more like Him. And tonight I'd like us to explore what I've called, the, the title of the message is, Temperance, Partaking of God's Nature. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would help us to understand and to learn and to absorb what you have for us tonight. I pray that you would show us where we need more temperance. Where we need temperance, maybe we don't have any. Maybe, maybe it's only part-time. Maybe it's only in small doses. We need it, its constant presence and its constant effect. I pray that you would bring us more and more in line with your character. Help us to appreciate your nature, your character, and to seek after that for ourselves, to, to have our heart changed, to let go of our own interests and ambitions and desires and, and conclusions and, and ideas and just take on yours and submit to your hand. I pray that you'd speak to us from your word, the word of God tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to talk about physical temperance, temperance in the physical life for a few minutes. The word temperance is defined as moderation. We've talked about that, particularly habitual moderation in regard to the indulgence of the natural appetites or, and passions. It is restrained or moderate indulgence as temperance in eating and drinking, temperance in the indulgence of joy or mirth, temperance in eating and, uh, and drinking as opposed to gluttony and drunkenness and in other indulgences. To excess. Uh, another definition is patience or calmness, sedateness, moderation of passion. And so we have restraint and moderation and self control. These things comprise temperance. Temperance could be described as the regulating or balance of other traits in the life. It's good for us to eat food, we, we need it to fuel our bodies and drink water. Um, uh, moistens, moisturizes, uh, keeps our bodies properly saturated, and we need to have those things in their proper amounts. But of course, we know people who, or maybe we ourselves, can be gluttons. Maybe people are too 
likely to, uh, or to, they, they, they spend too much time in leisure and in fun, recreation, and that's an imbalance, it's out of control. Temperance regulates these things. It is the opposite of indulgence, excess, and extremes. And we don't need to look very far in the Bible from where we are right now, and we see the results of intemperance or a lack of moderation. Let's look at verse 19 of Galatians 5, and we see the works of the flesh. And we all we find are intemperance and things that are not under control. Verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. They're obvious. They're, 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 they're visible. They're there to be seen. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we could go through each one of these and describe how adultery is is a result of intemperance. And fornication is a result of indulgence and, and a lack of, in, of temperance, uncleanness, and so on. We could go through each of these and talk about how these are normal desires in the flesh, but then they get warped and twisted, and then they're allowed to go and allowed to grow and run away with us, and suddenly we have these works of the flesh that are visible for everyone to see. This is what a lack of moderation brings to us, and I'm sure we could all give testimony to times in our life when we lived according to these things. We were given over to the indulgence of these things. Again, it might be the indulgence of laziness, maybe the indulgence of pride, the indulgence of anger, the indulgence of lust, and we could go on and on. We need temperance. We need restraint. This is, this is temperance shown in the physical life. And we could talk about it Ill, being illustrated in food, there are, I, I looked this up just to remind myself, I've read this before, there are five recognized flavors in food. And they're actually, contempl I don't know who they are, the powers that be. I, I, I'd like to see their office sometime, big sign, powers that be, or you know, they, the ones who make the decision. I don't know, but they're considering a sixth flavor. They're categorizing, considering categorizing a sixth flavor. Uh, which have to do with, with fats and, and oils. You're, apparently your tongue can, can sense when you're eating uh, animal fats. There's a different flavor that they think, not just a texture. That was, that was free. That was extra. You don't have to pay for that. But the five recognized ones are bitter and sour, sweet, salty, and savory. They're all delicious. They're all important as long as they're in the proper amounts. Nobody wants to sit down with a big chunk of salt... I mean, if you do, don't tell me. I don't want to know that. But I don't think we want, to, we want that. Nobody wants to eat something that's only bitter. It's fun to give something like a lemon to a little child and see the look on their face. But nobody, nobody wants to eat something that's only sour. But a little bit of bitterness to, the, to flavor the food can be really delicious. Of course, we know salt enhances the flavor of food. I like savory foods, but I like to, to offset it with other things. And we could go on. Moderation, restraint, control, the proper regulation of these things. If you have too much, they are distasteful. If you, have, if you don't have enough, these flavors aren't effective. You can add a little bit of salt and you don't even know it's there. What good did it do? You need just the right amount. Restraint is important when we're portioning these flavors. And we apply it to life. Let's apply it to physical life here, not just talk about illustrations. Turn over to Titus chapter 1. The epistle of Paul to Titus chapter 1, and he talks about temperance. We understand regulation and moderation and, and restraint when it comes to food, but... There are a lot more important things in life than food and some of these other things. Let's talk about important issues. Titus chapter 1, Paul is giving requirements for a bishop, for a preacher, for a pastor. Titus 1, 7, it says, For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, 
not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. So temperance is so important, it's a requirement for a pastor. And what is this talking about here? Well, if we look at the, the, the Greek here, it's, it's actually emphasizing the power or the might, the ability, the strength part of temperance. And I found that very interesting. It directly pertains to self-control. And, and we might, uh, to, to bring it to our vernacular, we might say it's self-discipline. He must be self-disciplined. He must have his life in order. He is under control. And it is important, of course, to have that power to be under control. We would say that seeking too much rest, seeking rest too much is called laziness. So you need to know and you need to be under control so that you don't do that. Seeking too much fun, we would call that frivolity. Eating too much food is called gluttony. We need restraint. And we have desires for these things, and these things are important in the proper amounts. Obviously, food and rest and, and even leisure and, and a, you know, a break, those things are important, but in their proper amounts. And if you don't have control over your own desires and your own mind and your own body to seek them in their proper amounts, your life is not under control. You, don't, you are not disciplined. And this is how we use this word, the self-discipline. You are not disciplined. You need restraint. We need the power to have these good things in their proper place and in their proper Amounts. Now look at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Paul writes, but, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Now this word is a different Greek word that's translated temperate. It's another part of temperance. And I found it interesting. It doesn't change the word temperate. I say this all the time. I just want to be very clear. It doesn't change the English word that we're reading. It doesn't, doesn't mean something else than temperate. But it does uh, add some nuance to the use of the word. Here we're talking about restraint in the area of understanding. It's important to have the strength to rein your, your desires in and your, to control and discipline yourself, but you also need understanding. This is, this is the wisdom and the understanding to know what self-control looks like. And we've, all, we've probably all known people that were very strong in certain areas, but they weren't temperate. They were able to do amazing things. And I, I think about maybe, maybe athletes are this way. They are incredibly disciplined when it comes to their sport, and they do amazing things to, to train their body and to bring their body into the, the, the um, type of conditioning that they need it to be in. But then you hear these stories where they're so good at doing the sport that they do, and they earn big contracts, and they have a successful career, and then two years after they've retired, they're broke. Well, they weren't temperate. They weren't under control. Because their spending and their, their, their money handling habits were, were terrible. They didn't know how to control their lives in other areas. So they had some, some strength, but they didn't, know under, they didn't have understanding of what it meant to be self-disciplined, what it meant to be temperate. But these aged men here need to be sober and grave, temperate. They need to have understanding to know what self-control looks like in their life and we would say, if you don't know, even speaking of the, the fruits of the Spirit, if you don't know when to show mercy and grace, somebody like that might be described as being harsh. You don't know when to show mercy and grace, and so you don't show it when you should. If you don't know when to be firm, we would say that person is lax. You don't know when to be firm. You, you, you don't have the understanding to know when you should be that way. If you don't know when to be slow to make decisions, and then on the other hand, you don't really know when to move forward in your decisions, you will end up making many wrong decisions. Because when you should be slow and careful, 
you just barge on ahead and make a quick decision. When you should, when it's time to move forward, it's time to make a choice, it's time to, time to set a course and you're, you're hesitant and slow and, and afraid, then you'll end up making many wrong decisions and having the understanding to know when, when am I under control, when am I regulated. Some, sometimes we can go one direction or the other. I'm just going to make a decision and go for it. Just go with it. You know, and sometimes it doesn't work out, but other times it does. So that's the, course, that's the kind of person I've decided to be. Well, that's not very temperate. That's just one extreme or the other. I always wait. I never make a decision quickly. That might be better more often than not, but sometimes you do need to make a quick decision. How do you know which is which? When you should do one and when you should do the other. We need understanding. And that's what temperance provides. It is the power, the ability, the strength to live as we ought and the understanding to know how we ought to live. Temperance is necessary. We need to be restrained in our actions, our thoughts and desires and wise to know how to employ and use those thoughts, desires, and actions. I think about bird dogs. I've done a little bit of duck hunting. I've done even less pheasant hunting. And I, I'm no expert by any means, but I've hunted a little bit with dogs here and there. And the dogs are assisting the hunters. And they're, it's great to have a dog that can go out and retrieve the birds and bring them back. And, and maybe if you're hunting upland game and the, birds, the dogs sniff the birds out and they point and then you can flush them out at the right time. They're, they're a great help. For instance, a Labrador retriever is considered one of the very best bird dog breeds. It, it's, it's, uh, if you can train it right, it's, it's one of the best breeds for being a bird dog, but they need to be disciplined and under control. An, an out of control bird dog is really not much better than any other kind of dog. An unre, untrained, unrestrained lab will completely ruin your hunt. And I'll tell you how I know later. <laughs> but let's talk about restraint. A leash is a form of restraint. It can physically restrain the dog, but without training, that dog can't hunt. You can keep him restrained, but he can't help you if it's only restraint. You can train the dog, and that will help the dog go and retrieve the bird and bring it back, but without self-restraint, without the dog restraining itself, his usefulness as a bird dog is very limited. Uh, many dogs can be trained to go fetch. You know, you throw a ball, they go fetch it, bring it back. And bird dogs can do the same thing. But if you're hunting and you need this bird dog to help you, you can't sit there and, and hold it back with a leash the whole time because then your hands aren't free for shooting and so on. His usefulness is limited. We could talk about training and self-restraint together. The dog's been trained to, to how to hunt and retrieve, and it is self-restrained. This kind of dog will quietly wait for the command and then goes and retrieves the bird when told to do so. And then you think about a dog that not only is trained, not only is self-restrained, but is experienced and has understanding and wisdom and, and this experience of, of the hunt. That kind of dog that is self-restrained and trained and practiced. I have seen some of these, I've seen videos online of expert trainers with their expert dogs and it is amazing the teamwork between those two the hunter is back standing and they you know they shoot shoot a bird and the dog goes off at the command and once they get out there into the slough it's hard to track exactly where the bird went because all the weeds around and so the, the dog needs help to guide it and and every so often a well-trained dog he'll, he'll run out there where he thinks it is doesn't find it he turns and looks back at the hunter and the hunter has hand motions and they work together the dog finds it and brings it back the dog provides its talents and abilities and the hunter provides what the dog needs the hunter gives minimal commands and the dog knows exactly what to do when to do it and doesn't do any more than that it's a great team that they make a great partnership and this is where you and i need to be going this is the direction we ought to be going with temperance in our life. Our desires need to be under control. And we know we, we, we can make 
we can know how to make different life decisions. If you've been walking with the Lord very long, you understand what it means to have your lusts under control. Don't give in to those lusts. Don't let those temptations take over and just carry you away. You understand what that's like to fight those and to bring those into subjection. You understand how to make different life decisions. Well, I've got a, you know, a big job decision coming up. I need to know what to do. You understand prayer and Bible study and counsel. You understand these things, how to make life decisions. And we, we can even know when they're needed. I know what to do. I, I've learned this. We'll always need daily guidance from our maker. But the more we are like Christ, the more temperance is, is restraining us and moderating us and guiding us and keeping us where we ought to be, the more we will work with our Lord and the less we'll struggle against what he's working to do. Sometimes we can, we're trying to do our best. We're trying to serve the Lord and it just seems like we're fighting him somehow. We're, we're not submitted to him. What's, what's going on? What am I missing? We need to be working with him and laboring with him. How, do, how is this demonstrated? We see, we see temperance demonstrated by holiness. This is part of being a temperate person. 1 Peter 1.13 says, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. It is in the mind where temperance begins in our life, and it resides in the mind. That's, that's where temperance has its effect. It guides our actions and our words and our thoughts. How you think determines how you live. If your thinking is intemperate, intemperate, or if your priorities are indulgent and excessive, your life will not be temperate. Sometimes we can think that I'm so disciplined. I get up at 6 o'clock every day. I go to bed at 9 p.m. every night. I eat supper at this hour and I exercise at this hour. My life is under control, but our thought life can be a total mess. We can be proud. We can be lustful. We can be angry. Whatever it is, our thought life is wrong. Temperance begins in the mind. If we are not in our right mind, we'll see... I should say, if we are in our, in our right mind, we'll see that temperate living and holy living are in perfect harmony. Everything must be moderated and controlled because otherwise we will not be consecrated unto Christ. Think about it. Tomorrow is a holiday. I think most of you, at least, don't have to work. That's typical for holidays. And I know from personal experience, it's easy to look ahead to a free day, some free time, and say, I wonder what I can do with that. I'm the focus. I'm not saying in that, in that moment, I'm not saying, Lord, how would you like to use this, this chunk of time in my life? I am, I am set apart for you. I belong to you. My time, my energies, my desires, everything is yours. So this is some free time, but I am not the object of this free time. You are the object of every part of my life, including this free time. How do you want me to use it? Temperate. I'm under control. I'm not just giving, giving free time to my desires to do whatever, anything. I can do anything the Bible commands me not to do. You know, if it's sinful, I shouldn't do that. But otherwise, it's all for me. Well, that's, that's not very temperate. That's not holy. Not set apart for God's glory, I become the focus. This self-focus was one of the problems in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned. Self was the focus, not God. Listen to Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, and notice the focus on self. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. 
She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. There was no questioning here, is this what God wants? Is this, is this going to bring glory to God? It was all about self. Looks good. It, 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 it'll taste good. It's pleasant to the eyes. It's, it's going to make me better. And so she took it and he ate it as well. Self becomes the focus. Holiness, on the other hand, is saying, what does God want? And I'm going to live and think and act as he would have me do. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? What manner of persons ought we to be? I need to be under control so I can be that kind of person. I need to understand what that is so I can be that. God is holy and he commands us to be holy. And the Lord could come back at any moment. We need to be temperate. We need to be in our right mind. We need to have the power and understanding to be self-controlled, moderated, regulated. Food and drink and play and work and exercise and rest... All of these things need to be in their proper amounts. All of them are important. Are we given to indulgence and excess? Well, I'm just a workaholic. It might be excess. That might just be your area of indulgence. If we're given to indulgence and excess, that's not temperate. And it's not under the Spirit's control. So let's talk, that's physical temperance. Things in our physical, temporal life, and they're spiritually related, but they're, they're things that are temporal and visible and tangible and so on. Let's talk about spiritual temperance for a few minutes. What is its purpose, temperance? What is temperance's purpose as a fruit of the Spirit? What does it purpose to do in our spiritual lives? And, and why is it a separate fruit? We could say, you know, if you have love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness, isn't that how we ought to be living? I mean, look at all these things I have in my life. I, these are all good traits. Isn't, I mean, wouldn't we say, good job, you're done? Why is temperance included? If you have all these other fruits, wouldn't we say, oh, I'm not carnal. I've got all these others in my life. Why do I need temperance? It's like if you put so much good in, why do you need to worry about it anymore? There's, there, these fruits of the Spirit, I'm not, I'm not carnal. I'm not given to, to the wrong things. Well, for help with this, let's look to the Lord. Let's look at his, his nature a little bit. These traits do belong to him and originate from him after all. Turn to 2 Corinthians or 2 Chronicles, excuse me. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. How does temperance demonstrate or, or act in our spiritual life? Because it is a fruit of the Spirit. It has an effect on the other, on the other traits, the other fruits of the Spirit. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. Verse 14, it says, Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord, which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. Terrible sin. We understand this part of Israel's history. And the Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers rising up betimes and sending over and over because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. We understand this, showing such mercy, such patience, such long-suffering with their sin and saying, you need to repent. And we know that the whole ministry of Isaiah was proclaiming and warning of coming judgment over and over, repent, repent, God's judgment is coming. And they would a little bit, and then they would sort of delay the judgment. But you need to repent. You need to, you need to turn back. You need to turn around. 
This past, these two verses describe God's mercy and grace and long-suffering pretty well, but let's keep reading. Verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, till there was no more remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. So we see God rising up, raising up prophets, rising them up betimes and sending, and they mocked until the wrath of the Lord arose, till there was no more remedy. There was a remedy for a while, and then no more. How could God be long-suffering and wrathful? We see it right here. How could he be both? And I believe the answer is temperance. Psalm 2.12 says, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. And then it says, Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Wait, he's wrathful? and it's kindled, and you can perish from the way, but, but you're blessed if you trust in him. How can both of these, how could some be blessed and some judged? Temperance. Look at Romans chapter 1. We see these different things in God's nature, in God's character, and I'm so glad that they're all there. I'm so glad that God does demonstrate his wrath, but he also his long-suffering. I'm glad he is compassionate, but also just. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness and fornication and wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. These people, it's very clear, these people that are described here are not saved. They are lost. God gave them over to this. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to see a description of some very similar people, some very similar sins with a major difference. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So in Romans chapter 1, we see that God gave them over. And here we find very similar kinds of sins and lifestyles. And instead, these people were saved. How can God do both? Temperance. God's temperance. God is love. The Bible is very clear about that. But he is not only love. God is merciful. But he is not only merciful. God is just. But he is not only just. And this is where we get into... an. Uh, an intellectual area, for lack of a better description, where we start to reach the borders of what we're capable of understanding about God. And we can't wax too eloquent in describing God, because He is God. And these traits, again, are not separate and distinct and not at all related to the others. Because somebody might hear me say, God is just, but he is not only just. And think that because God is not only just, that cheapens the justness that he has. 
or that changes it somehow. It doesn't change it. And, and we, can't, we can't accurately or adequately describe God's nature. We do the best that we can, but all of God's traits are perfectly mixed and controlled. God is full of all of them. Let's look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1, this is the passage describing Christ and how he is from God. Look at John 1, 14. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, grace, we understand that. Truth fits with grace, but truth also fits with wrath and with judgment. And we know that God is holy or completely just. God is love. All of these things are perfectly mixed. He is full of all of them. There is nothing that is missing. Everything is in perfect harmony with everything else that God is. And we are not like that. We tend to lean one way or the other, to sort of hop around from one to the other and do this for a while, and then we jump over here and we do this for a while, and it's sort of like this juggling act. They're all up in the air if, if we're doing well, if we're walking with the Lord. We've got all the balls, all the traits here that we need, and we're sort of juggling them. And it's, none of it's perfectly mixed like it is in God's character. And here's what I mean. Some people may pride themselves, and I use that word pride. It can mean actual pride, but it might just be self-satisfaction. They, 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 they gain satisfaction from being loving. They are very loving. And as a result, they end up being too permissive. That's possible for us to be that way. Some people may pride themselves on being fair and just, and then they end up without mercy and long-suffering. They're so fair and so just, everybody gets the same, and they're not long-suffering anymore or merciful. Some may focus on patience. Just be patient, and as a result, they, never, they will never judge sin. Obviously, these are, these are not right. God is not like this. God never shortchanges one trait in order to satisfy another. And, and I, I really have resisted using the word balance in this context because when I think of balance in relation to God's nature, what I think of when I, when I think of that word is I don't want to go too much to love because then love becomes bad. I don't want to go too much away from love because then, you know, justness becomes bad. And when God is involved, love is always good. Justice is always good. Mercy is always good. And he's always those things. And so there's not this dangerous extreme with God. I believe, personally, what makes more sense to my thinking, and maybe, maybe this makes sense to you, I think that what we ought to be talking about is lacking some of those traits. So if I am only love and not just, that's a problem. But love is never bad, and when God employs love, it's always perfectly done. There's not an extreme to love that makes it bad, but he always has all of the traits, and they're always in their proper place and always doing the proper things. It's temperance. They're mixed. They're, they're, they're all equal and together, working together. God never stops being one thing, like long-suffering, in order to be another. He is always perfectly, infinitely, sinlessly God. Temperance is the trait that we need in order to be more like him in this way. We all have tendencies uh, towards good things, I think, especially if you walk with the Lord. And, and, and you might tend to be, you, you just see things more fairly, you see justice. That's just a strength of yours, and you see justice. Maybe, maybe as a result, you don't see the opportunity for long-suffering as much. You tend to be less uh, merciful to people. Other people, they, they just they have a heart to love others, and it comes so easily for them. But maybe they don't see 
when it's necessary to judge sin. Maybe judge it in their own life, maybe judge it in their children's lives. We, we have our tendencies in weak areas, and it's, it's lacking these traits that the problem is. It's not, well, you're just too loving. Well, by that definition, God's too loving, but he's not. He is love. He's just not only love. He doesn't lack anything. We need temperance, not just to keep our desires and habits under control, but we also need temperance to know when to treat others with mercy or when to treat them with justice or when to treat them with long-suffering or gentleness. For an example, let's turn to Acts chapter 5. The Apostle Peter found himself in many different kinds of situations, and we'll look at two that maybe would have been easy if we were placed into both of these scenarios. We would have responded more with a cookie-cutter type of reaction, but Peter didn't. He needed temperance to know when to treat others with different traits or not. Acts chapter 5 Verse 1, but a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whiles it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much? And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Very sad and tragic uh, episode here. Of course, Peter, it wasn't his power that, that killed these, this couple. It was God that did that. But Peter knew how to respond to these people. Peter didn't say, did you sell it for so much? Yes, for that much. Are you sure? You know, maybe you should rethink this because there'll be consequences. He didn't, he didn't do that. He didn't ignore it. He didn't laugh it off. He, didn't, he answered it exactly as he should have. Acts chapter 8 Let's look at Acts chapter 8, and we find a different scenario, and Peter handled it differently. Acts 8, 18. And when Simon, Simon the sorcerer, when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. Very, very selfish and greedy attitude. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Peter didn't try to, to bring retribution on this man. He rebuked him and he said, you need to repent. And there is a chance. We see that. I mean, he wouldn't have said this if, he is, if there wasn't a chance to repent. Peter exhorted him, you need to repent. It was a serious, a serious situation, but very much with different consequences. How did Peter know how to respond? Temperance, moderation, control. We look earlier in Peter's life and we see a lack of temperance, don't we? Impetuousness, being, being carried away maybe with emotions and ideals, not temperate. Because he was under control, more, more, more specifically because he was filled with the Spirit, the Spirit guided Peter 
instead of Peter being carried away by his own urges. It's a sad thing, a sad, a sad truth about our, our sinful nature that you and I can be carnal and self-willed even in the area of exhibiting godly traits. And it's, it's, it's too bad that we can, we can honestly desire to exhibit long-suffering and, and meekness and humility, but we can do it for carnal reasons or self-willed motivations. Does the Holy Spirit of God have control of our heart? Is he bringing his fruit into our daily life? Do we have love in our life? Is this a fruit of the Spirit that is present? Do we have joy? Do we have peace? Is there long-suffering in our life? Do we have gentleness and goodness and faith? Are we meek? Are all of these traits being mixed properly with temperance and by temperance? With, all, with temperance, we will have the strength and the discernment to employ these things properly. When does your child need mercy? When do they need long-suffering? When do they need justice? When does your neighbor need patience or need you, know, you to be confrontational with them? Well, if we're carried away with our own tendencies, we're not going to be choosing these things properly. We need to be temperate, under control. The more that each fruit of the Spirit fills us and is mixed with the others, the more we become like our Lord. The more we behave toward others with all of these fruits present and cooperating together, as they do in the nature of God, He is full of all these things and they cooperate together to make Him God. The more that we behave towards others this way, the more we'll treat them like God treats them. This is temperance. This is the effect that it can have on our lives. This is what God does in us. It's not about self-control. Just, just try harder. Just be more disciplined. It's, it's a lot more than that. It's a fruit of the Spirit. I, I can work hard and I can, you know, I can get up at the same minute on the clock every single day. And that's discipline, but that's not the same thing as temperance. I can try to do it in the power of the flesh. You can. That's not temperance. This is a fruit of the Spirit and it, it moderates and controls and mixes and guides all these other traits. It makes us more like the Lord. It's a fruit of the Spirit. And may He do that work in us. Let's pray. Father, I thank You for this passage in Galatians chapter 5 that tells us about the fruit of the Spirit. And we ought to appreciate each one mentioned. But we also need to recognize that it isn't about dissecting and categorizing and putting everything into an easy-to-understand textbook. It really is about a relationship with you. And we don't have to fully analyze everything in order to exhibit it by simply walking with you, simply being filled with the Spirit. Help us to know and appreciate this about God that that God is always appropriate in what he does. Sometimes he's loving, sometimes he's patient, sometimes there is no more remedy and judgment comes. And even in those times, God is still being merciful and loving and long-suffering. He is always perfectly, infinitely God. And Lord, I thank you that you want to make us more like that. Help us to be under control in our physical practices. Help us to be under control in our thought life. Help us to have understanding, to know when we're under control and when we are maybe doing it in the power of the flesh. Maybe we're in one direction or another. We're lacking certain traits. Help us to understand those things. But most of all, help us to be filled with the Spirit and just let you do the work. Help us to draw near to you, to seek to walk with you every day. And when we do, you'll accomplish these things by your own power, your own strength, and for your own glory. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's all stand together. We'll have a brief moment of invitation. If God's spoken to you about, maybe he spoke to you about a different fruit of the Spirit tonight, but whatever it is, if he's spoken to your heart, the altar's open. You're welcome to come down and respond. We need to be responsive to the Lord when he speaks to us. Let's not push him away. Let's not ignore what he's done or what he's saying. Let's not be distracted. Oh, I'll do it later. I'll deal with it later. No, let's, let's deal with it now. We need to be temperate. We need to be under control, but not under the control of the flesh, under control of the Spirit. We need wisdom to know that our response yesterday in a certain situation might need to be different from our response tomorrow in that same kind of situation. How will we know? How are we able to respond differently? Well, only if we're under control, only if we're temperate and not indulging ourselves, if we're being regulated and, and moderated by the Spirit of God and by the traits of God. I surrender all. That's the attitude the Lord's looking for. Why don't you look up here for a moment, please? I'm going to ask Brother Burns to come. We're going to begin the graduation in just a moment. The, the graduates will come out, but we're going to sing a congregational hymn, a verse or two of it. So I'll ask 